Well, hello there and welcome. My name is Kylie Patchett and I'm your host and welcome to the Wild and Finally Fucking Free podcast. This show is all about sharing the real and raw stories from women who have undergone midlife metamorphosis, taken a leap of faith or broken the ties that bind them in patterns of staying stuck, small and like their needs don't matter. You see, I believe that the years leading up to and during menopause are a rite of passage, a deep invitation after so many years of giving our time, attention and energy to others to carve out the same time, energy and attention in ourselves, in our health, our love, our connection, our vitality, our purpose, our real needs and deep desires. You know, those ones lying dormant underneath all the duty, responsibility, pushing, striving and achieving of our 20s and 30s? You see, at this stage in our lives, we find ourselves shifting identity potentially, no longer caring as much what other people think and left wondering why on earth we have not given ourselves permission to do life in the way we truly want to. In this show, I speak to the women brave enough to truth talk their own midlife shedding skin stories and the healers and helpers who help them transition through these crossroads of change. This is the midlife magic you didn't even know you needed, and I am so freaking glad you found us. Let's dive in. Hello, beautiful people. It's Kylie obviously. (laughs) Before we dive into this episode, I wanted to give you a little reminder that if you haven't already listened to it, episode 33 uh, is actually me sharing a bit about my own mental health slash mood journey uh, in perimenopause and how it has woken me back up to the fact that I had quite forgotten to look after some of my really basic human needs. (laughs) Like, I don't know, good sleep hygiene, making sure I was eating regularly and my blood sugar was even, um, and taking time out to have fun and to rest. And yeah, if you're anything like me and you're finding that the perimenopause symptoms are buffeting you around a little then I have created something very special for you. It is a 55 page, yes, it kind of grew, <laughs> 55 page guide. It's full of really simple, straight talking, back to basics, self care for perimenopause and beyond. Um, it includes information about what you can expect with perimenopause and the biology behind the changes. So if you're a wild learner like me, that's really cool to understand. Uh, It's got the back to basic self-care anchors, which will allow us to navigate perimenopause, the roller coaster, with a little bit more of an even keel. I've also included the bullshit stories, which stop us taking care of ourselves, particularly when our perimenopause symptoms make us feel just like, like just not like ourselves, right? And also an invitation to become more gentle and more self-compassionate towards ourselves. So if you're like me and you have been, yeah, in some stormy seas lately, please take advantage. This is a totally free guide. I just put together all of my, yeah, years and years and years of holistic health and mindset and mind, body, breath, wisdom into one 55 page guide. You can grab your free copy uh, on the pod page, which is www.kyliepatchett.com.au. All right, let's dive into the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wild and Finally Fucking Free. I have a return guest today for the very first time. Very exciting. If you haven't listened to episode 15, you need to go back there now listen to the beautiful Nick Little sharing her story and we called it rock bottom to rising with resilience. I do love an alliteration, don't I? (laughs) Um, Nick shared so much freaking gold about your transition or transformation that you thought was the big transformation and it turned out to be something different, all sorts of golden relationship and restaking a claim on what you wanted life to look and feel like. So welcome back. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> it's funny, I'm like looking back at the show notes from that episode and I'm like, I know we had a major major conversation, but I'm looking at all the points going, shit, we really did cover some ground, didn't we? 
We really did. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and here we are to continue. So here we are. Lots more. Lots yes. More to cover, I think. Yeah. I think. And when Nick and I finished that first conversation, we were like, "Oh my god, we didn't talk about this, and we didn't talk about this." Like, so all these major themes. And then something else has been coming up that you were like, "Oh, I want to go down this juicy path." So, where do you want to go today? I want to talk about rage. <laughs> <laughs> rage, anger, um, you know, because I think I think it's a uh I think it's an experience of perimenopause. Yep. And menopause. Mm-hmm. Um and and I think women are, you know, we've been demonized for our anger and our rage over mm-hmm. the years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I and you know, I've had my own experience of that as I went through all of that that journey of um you know changing my life and realizing that where I was where I was and where I was potentially heading was not where I wanted to go and then Mm. kind of unpacking all of the things in my life that had brought me there and I was so fucking angry at a lot of it that I'd bought into you know a lot of the lies that you know, that mm-hmm. have been that get leveled at women about mm-hmm. what our lives are supposed to look like. And mm-hmm. it really took me a long time to unpack it um, and understand it and be comfortable. And I'm still, and I think I'm still working on it because there are moments where I'm like just still really angry at mm. the world. Um, so, yeah, I thought. I'm quite sure that there's other women out there that uh, experience anger and, you know, maybe don't talk about it, discuss it because, you know, there's for some reason there's a shame attached Mm. to it. Um, Well, we're taught that we, that's not the expectation of a girl. If we talk about like what we're expected to be like that as good girls. Give us a smile, love. Yeah, give us a smile, love. Don't you look pretty? It's all about um, being like visually and behaviorally pleasing to other people. Yeah, make and anger's not mm. anger's not part of that picture, right? Um, no, no. And I what I've what I've discovered along the you know because I'm now quite I you know I don't think I I I've kind of I mean and we'll go into it, but I've kind of feel like I've come to a place now where the rage and the anger that I was almost frightened of because I didn't really want it to leak out. I didn't want it to impact other people. Um, But I had to do something because it was impacting me Mm. um, quite severely. And so when I started to learn how to express it in a way that was either setting a boundary or stating a need or expressing a past hurt or a past grief, it was met by, you know, some people didn't, really didn't like it and and I'm talking mostly on social media you know like on my own Facebook page where I would mm. say something and then there'd be a comment uh from men and my friend group who would make a comment about the anger oh you need to get over that and no, not all men you know that kind of and I was like wow you're still I'm I'm nearly 50 and you're still trying to tell me to put my anger away no no, that is fuck off sound. No. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's something that we, uh, it's an individual journey through understanding our own anger and then being okay with it and being able to express needs, set boundaries comfortably um, and being okay with it, like not being, mm. ashamed. like my anger is and was valid. That's mm. end of story. That, Do you know what I me. As you're talking, I'm just remem- remembering that I used to use the term justifiable anger. Mm. Oh, my God. So I'm <laughs> having this really funny, like, not deja vu. It's like a reverse deja vu. I used to actually talk about my anger in terms of whether it was justifiable or not justifiable. Mm. So I was doing to myself what the Mm. Facebook people, the Facebook police were doing to you. This is okay anger. This is not okay anger. Well, and that's kind of, I guess that's exactly what I I would, there was something else that I was going to bring up, but Mm. I'll bring it up now because it's Mm. exactly what you're describing is that Mm. internalised misogyny. Mm. So, Mm. you know, 
I, I was very, very, very angry at the misogyny that's in the world. And anyone who tries to tell you that it doesn't exist, like, yeah, take your head out of your ass because the world is, that's the fabric of our society, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And so I was, the the anger I was feeling was quite, it was external to society and the rules and the and mm-hmm. the unconscious biases and but what I came to realize I, I someone I came across the term internalized misogyny and it mm. really hit me like a, a map truck you know it was like mm. I've internalized all of that misogyny and I've projected it at other women too you know demonized other women for yep. stepping outside of what you know society tells us we should be doing um and real and shaming myself yeah and, turned it into this self-flagellation tool yeah to make yeah. yourself wrong yeah and and I just don't think that we can I don't think we can ever overcome the, uh misogyny or the patriarchy whatever you want however you want mm. to frame it but I don't think we can overcome that without addressing the internalized misogyny so looking at within and, and how we actually judge shame ourselves mm-hmm. um, and let's face it how we've been conditioned to be part of the machine that supports yeah the environment that we're talking about yeah so you know beautiful example let's sell women a perfect body and make yeah. them feel less than if they don't fit that and yes yeah. we can say that's all driven by money making and rah 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 it is also very much driven by the idea that women are here to serve. And obviously we're talking about, you know, if we're honouring that now we're very aware that people are on a gender spectrum and everything. So when we yeah, say, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I'm, yeah. you know, yes. I'm, I am talking about everyone who identifies. Yeah. I do feel like part of what we have been conditioned by are these versions of exactly what we were talking about. The way to be an attractive or good woman slash girl is to be pleasing to the eye, be a particular way, be submissive, be this, be that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when our very nature is trying to be squashed into these things, Mm -hmm. it's very fucking natural to feel angry about that. Like we literally, you know, Actually, from a, you know, now that you, you've you studied psychology, if you if I was to say to you what is the purpose of anger, because mm. the, you know, all emotions have a purpose, what is the purpose of anger? Let's go mm. right back to the basics of like. Yeah, well, I think so, and this isn't anything that I've learned. Yeah, I know, I know. But psychology, this is, this is just something that I have felt for a long time and it's uh, so anger, first of all, anger is the awareness of a lie. Yeah whether that's a lie you're telling yourself or a lie that's being fed to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also an awareness of boundaries being boundaries crossed. Boundaries being crossed, yeah. So, which is kind of the same thing, but, um, and I'm, I'm getting goosebumps, so I'm kind of yeah. going, yeah. So, yep. you know, I can be angry at someone else and not understand why and then go, well, you know, it's not necessarily the lie that they're telling me. It could be the lie they're telling themselves, mm-hmm. you know, yep. and that frustrates me because for me, um, and and I think you can relate to this too, you want you want people to grow and change. I, there's nothing yeah. I love more than watching someone have an aha moment or, you know, I get, mm-hmm. I'm one of those people that gets quietly excited about an existential crisis. Because I'm like, not that I would say to someone, this is great. No, you know, not necessarily in the middle of but, it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's but it's kind of like, oh wow, we've got an opportunity to grow. And then, you know, if I can be part of that for someone, then it's an honor. Yeah. Um, so yeah, lies that people tell themselves can make us angry as well. So yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I love lies. That. Awareness of lies and boundaries being crossed. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think so there's a couple of things that I want to, I guess what I want to do is zoom all the way out to something that you said in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I really want this conversation to help people normalise all Mm. of the range of emotions that can start turning up stronger and stronger in the perimenopause transition. 
Yeah. And one of the things I found it very interesting, I've just finished doing like a self-care guide and I did more um, reading and research on how menopause is framed in mm. media and, you know, even in the, you know, Australian men- um, Australasian menopause society and the, like all the big sort of sources of information. Mm. Interesting, some of them specify rage being part of the normal symptoms of perimenopause. Mm. Others say and neither's more or less correct, but I think that mm. it is contributing to the feeling of the rage not being okay or mm. whatever, not being normal, um, is mood swings. Oh, yeah. So mood swings to me, it really doesn't envelope my personal experience of the swings of emotion. Like, no. yes, it is a mood swing, but mm. we're talking, we're not on a garden variety swing we're on a fucking swing that goes 360 and I can be upside fucking down and so fucking angry at myself or someone else that I want to rip their face off. Yeah. And I, I really, 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 really strongly believe that part of the whole purpose of this transition of perimenopause is mother nature's very Mm. perfectly timed Mm. holding our feet to the fire of things that we cannot continue to tolerate. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's where the rage comes from because isn't some of the rage, or I don't know, rather than putting words into your mouth, I'll ask you a question. Do you feel that some of the rage is actually at yourself for falling for the lies? Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, it's a it's a trap of, you know, if you're someone who has a history or a habit of self-loathing or, you know, um, then you can internalize that anger um, and it can yep. be quite destructive. And I yep. think for me, and I have had a tendency to do that as well mm-hmm. over the years, but I think um, I've always had a, a fire in my belly that's gone, uh uh-uh, uh, no way, this isn't you, it's not you. Um, or I've, you know, got some really good, um, genuine, down to earth, salt of the earth type friends that will go, like yeah. really like objectively yeah yeah pull me up on it um mm. but you know anger anger I think anger has anger and rage that like you said it, it has a purpose and it can mm. motivate us I mean I truly 100% attribute to finishing my degree while soul parenting and you know having no um real clue of what my future was going to look like mm-hmm. and working so hard that was driven by Mm. the anger I was starting to feel at where my life had ended up because I was and it was really interesting because in my second semester I took a um an elective subject in creative writing Mm -hmm. and I actually pulled some of the stuff up to share with you if you want yeah yeah it was it was the perfect timing for me to be doing creative writing because it gave me creative freedom to just spill and the rage out and, you know, and to be praised for it. Lance the boil. <laughs> you know, and I remember sitting in class one day and I was reading out a, po- a poem or something I'd written and one of the young girls in class, there was just silence. And one of the young girls goes, who hurt you? And I just looked at her and went, the whole fucking world, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, and also can we add the addendum? Oh, you'll understand. Yeah, when you will understand. She would have been in her early 20s. Oh, yeah. In 20 years' time, you come back to me. (laughs) You'll know. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, it motivated me. I'm I'm quite sure that I wouldn't have even started the degree had I not been so fucking angry. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So, it's not a bad thing. Mm -mm. Anger is not. I don't. Yeah. I totally own my anger and my Mm. rage now. And, um. And I think but there's a balance because you need to, there's also a balance of Mm. you can't blame. It's not about blaming Mm -mm. and you can be angry angry and blame, but if, but there's, that's a lie you're telling yourself too. Mm -hmm. You've got to take responsibility for, you know, yep. um, The choices that you've made and, and, you know, and forgive yourself for, you know, buying the lies as well. Oh my God. Yes. Self-compassion and self-responsibility have been massive themes for me yeah. lately. Um, yeah. Certainly feeling the, um, 
a lot of different emotions come to the surface and one of them has been actually rage was definitely my experience early on. I think where I'm at at the moment is more um, anger and then grief. And I actually want to ask because we have similar histories of parental inability to see and hear our own needs I guess that's probably an easy way of saying it how much of the way that you were interacted with as a child do you feel has contributed to how how the rage has come up and how comfortable you have been at least in the early stages um around that oh I think it's come from like that's where um you know, my mum, because, and, I, you know, I, I don't like talking too much about my mum because she has a huge, she had a huge trauma history. So mm. while her behaviour towards me, um, you know, we can label it as abusive, whatever, I, mm-hmm. I now understand that it's it was her rage and it was her trauma and her inability to um, fight the system. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. You know, um, but yeah, so you know, my dad was, um, you know, misogynistic. My dad yeah. was a Freemason. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> oh bless. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I love him dearly. But yeah, he was a Freemason. We're, and like I said in the last podcast, Dad and I have talked about this a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, and Mum, my Mum had a huge internalized rage and um, blamed herself for a lot of things, and that kind of and she hated women so you know uh, that for me that became Mm. she must hate me because you know Mm -hmm. um so yeah there was um I can't really remember the your full question but yeah so I just yeah, yeah um and so and the pleasing you know the pleasing because my dad would always say to me uh you know dad would say I'm gonna be I'll always be your main the your main love and yeah and and, you know I'm your first love and then yeah yeah yeah. anyway but yeah yeah daddy's little girl and then um you know and then and then he'll hand me over to my husband you know like it was was that kind of narrative that Mm -hmm. I was fed from from a very young age Mm -hmm. um actually can I read you something that relates to that yeah yeah go for it I love where we're going because you've actually just Sorry, before you read that, you've yeah. actually just given me an aha moment around my own mum, and I'm in a similar place. Yeah. I am very aware and grieving the fact that my needs were not seen and met as a yeah. child, and I'm also equally aware and compassionate towards the fact that that was because of deep trauma that my mum yeah. has never, ever dealt with, yeah. um, even spoken out loud to me. Yeah. Um and I think that we can still be angry at oh, yeah. having the space, you know, to because yeah. I feel like when I used to say justifiable anger, one of the reasons that I used to say that is that it's not fair that I had to deal with some of the things I dealt with as a yeah. kid. Yeah. Like that's not I'm angry that that was my experience. Yeah. Anyway, continue because you've just and given I, me an aha moment. Well, and that's really what I was talking about before about how to be okay with your anger but not projecting it outward you know yes I'm still allowed to be angry but I can have compassion for my parents and where they were at at the yeah, time absolutely but it doesn't mean that I shouldn't be angry because mm. I am still fucking angry do you know um something so we recently when I was on the sunny coast had dinner and we found ourselves a group of people similar age we were talking about the mother line yeah and I was like I don't want to know about it because I have this, you know, difficult relationship with my mum. And something that Bella said was Mm. something along the lines of, and I'm not sure if she's talking to me or you, but it was like, don't cut yourself off from the power of the generation just because of the trauma in the chain. And I was like, boom. Yeah. Like how powerful is that? Because um, I've since had a conversation with my mum about her mother's mother and the behavior her mother's mother had and I was like oh my god I'm just yeah. the latest yeah. in generations and generations of pain yeah 
about yeah. being a woman and how yeah. to be a woman and serving yeah. men and putting your needs last and all of those yeah, yeah ridiculous notions. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> all right. So just this was just on the um, like it, kind of in those lines of what we were talking about. Mm. So this is what one of the things that I wrote for the creative writing course. Mm. She couldn't remember when, but she knew she was very young when the lights went out and she had to learn how to see in the dark. Mm. She never questioned why, only she knew that it was just the way it was, yep. that her brother was given different promises than her when they exited the womb, mm. that these unspoken rules of being a girl were unquestionable, that she was aware of a lie within which she merely existed and for which she could never find words for, that she was tormented by the denial of herself, that she was in a prison sentence, her only crime being born a girl. She tried so hard to be polite, to not be too loud, too bold, too opinionated or too clever. She was secretly afraid of the wild girl within because that girl could drown oceans. That girl had the sharpest of tongues and the quickest of wits and the fiercest of fires in her belly. Mm. Her mother knew it too. The resentment was palpable. Her mother was not going to allow that defiant little bitch to step out of place. Ooh. How dare she think she had the right to be more woman than me? How dare she indeed? Oh, my God. <laughs> Did you just pull that out of my head? I mean, I don't have a brother. That's the only, yeah. that's the only thing that I don't relate to. Um, yeah. Firstly, so beautifully written to put words to that feeling. And I wrote down um, oh, so many words like denial of self, polite, mm. loud, bold, clever, like all of the things that we have been taught are the rightness. Mm. And the knowing that, you were not allowed to expand past the version of womanhood that was being shown yeah. to you. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that I reckon you have captured in words what my like life healing mission is about is actually being comfortable being mm. as powerful as I actually am. Yeah. Because yeah. I was given no... Yeah, it's like, what did you say, drown oceans? What was the ocean like? Um, that girl called? Yeah, because the wild girl within could drown oceans. Mm. That girl had the sharpest of tongues and the mm. quickest of wits. Mm. Yeah. Because I was very witty. I'm I'm very yeah. witty and smart arsy and, mm. and uh, oh, my God, my mum hated it. Mm. She, yeah, she really yeah. didn't. She didn't like it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and I think that... A woman, she can she can be angry because she's using anger to empower herself. Mm. I, I really believe that. Yeah. Um, but it but you have to be wise with how you use it. You it's you can't just spit it out and bleed it out all over everybody. You yeah. know. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I have the term yeah. sacred rage in my head and I don't mm. think that's my terminology. I'm very sure that I've read it and it's actually, I think it's something to do with the story from Sarah of Magdalene that I follow on Instagram mm. who has equally beautiful ways of pulling feelings into these words that I'm just like, yes. Actually, I'm going to find this post because it's so aligned to what <laughs> we're talking about. It's like, <sighs> Can I find it when I'm on my computer? That is the question. And this story is no longer available. That's very <laughs> helpful. Okay, here we go. I've only I've only screenshot or you know shared one of the one of the probably ten like slides in Instagram. Mm. But she says, at midlife, the man-made machine of me stopped functioning completely and under my feet was ever shifting and breaking ground. Mm. It felt like all I was ever doing was letting people down. And the graphic is like a woman standing right in the middle of fire. And I'm just like, this is the mm. fire, people. This is the yeah. Reality of waking up to denying yourself. And I, the, the language I've used on the podcast before is abandoning yourself, but it's like knowing that you're this, but yeah. pretending that you're that. Yeah. And just, yeah. And 
it becomes, like you said, it becomes so unbearable. You can't tolerate pretending anymore. And I think, like, I don't know, like when you read, like like I was saying before, like reading through menopause booklets and, men, and you know, obviously when you're looking at the scientific and medical sites, like obviously they're not yeah, going to be talking true. about the feelings yeah. and the whatever. Yeah. But I'm like, we're trying to clean this transition up, which at the moment for me personally, at least, feels like I'm being pushed through the eye of a needle. Like that. Yeah, I mean, it's they're trying to pathologize it, and yeah, exactly. You know, um, like tell the clinical story. I'm like, this yeah. feels very fucking uncomfortable, but yeah. I also have a deep sense that it is all this perfect natural cycle of us mm. having the combination. I know I keep saying these things on the podcast, but it just feels so strongly is the zero fucks to give less tolerance for bullshit and mm. less emotional bandwidth. However, that shows up for yeah. you yeah. Um, where you literally cannot continue mm. to pretend to be anything but what mm. you are. Mm. And I feel like the deep pain that people can um experience I don't know I I, there's no way that I want to diminish anyone's Mm. reality and I'm very much um very present to the fact that everybody's experience is very different and you and I are both Mm. um have the blessing to be at the time of our lives where we have like the you know we've got kids out of school like we're not can you imagine going through this when you've got a fucking three or four year old in the house no or an early teenage girl like a 12 year old girl I would just be like I'm out I'm going to live in a yurt in some (laughs) far off forest like I'm done I can't do this so thank god for the blessing of us arriving at this point in lives where we do have a bit more space but also honoring that that's not everyone's you know Mm. experience um where was I going with all that I got off track um can we go back to you said that you had so Women Who Run With Wolves, one of, you know, these, oh, yeah. these key yeah. texts that's, it's Clarissa, I can't remember her last name. Clarissa. Oh, I, yeah, it's uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes. That's it. Okay. And we'll I don't think show I've notes. said that right because I've never actually heard anyone pronounce it, but that's yeah. how I've always pronounced it. Yeah, Clarissa. yeah. Okay. Um, and I was saying I bought it, uh, but both of us bought it about 20 years ago. I've lost my copy. I think I lent it to someone. I've never read it from beginning to end because it felt really heavy. Mm-hmm. And it came, it's come up in my windshield three times this week. And I'm like, all right, I'm listening. I'm going to order it. Yeah. I'll, I'll read. But you wanted to read us something out of that that was um, aligned to this discussion of anger mm. and the perfection of it. Yeah, and I just thought because sometimes it's easier to read something and then unpack it than to Mm. try and kind of um so I mean I hope I hope this is okay for your listeners but yeah I I'm absolutely sure like honestly yeah it's been such a big theme at the moment and particularly Mm. with friends but also clients where it's like I feel this and it's this automatic like I don't want to it's uncomfortable it's not right it's not whatever I'm like whoa 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 whoa. hang on a minute Mm. (laughs) Well, interestingly, as when you were talking about that whole, you know, like um, removing the, the false self or the self. That we, yes. I, I was in my head. I had this because I'm a visual. Yeah, kind of, me too. Um, metaphor person. And I had this thing of like, so I was so frightened that if I was my authentic self, what if that's rejected, right? Mm-hmm. So while you were talking, I had this kind of vision of myself of my guides or whoever, yeah, pushing me out onto a stage Ooh. <laughs> and me resisting going. So it's yeah. that whole presenting yourself to the world as this is me, you know. Deeply naked. vulnerable. Yeah. If we show up with yeah. no clothes on, like no none of the <laughs> protective layers and then people still don't like us, well, far out. Yeah. But do you know like what? Yeah, it's not so bad if you reject my false self because I yeah. can just recreate that. But if you reject my authentic self, then that's it, I'm gone. Do you not feel like, though, like when you're saying that, I'm like one part of me goes, yeah, that would suck, and the other part goes, but at least I'd be true to myself. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. Because yeah. I feel like I am 
the things that are causing me the most pain right now is when I'm abandoning myself. Yes, yes. It's absolutely. not about other people's yeah. reaction to me. It's not. In fact, I couldn't give a fuck whether you like yeah. me or not anymore. And yeah. that is <laughs> deeply <Yeah>. freeing. <laughs> it gets uncomfortable really quickly now, doesn't it, when you know that mm. you're not being yourself. Yeah. I can't even, sometimes I was talking about this in the episode that I just um, recorded with Chris Emery. We're talking about voice and vulnerability and finding a voice. And I actually get a physical discomfort thing if mm. I'm speaking anything that doesn't feel completely true. Yeah. And I feel like it's like what you were saying before about the anger thing. You've got to be careful how that's let out because obviously yeah. sometimes people are not ready for the unfiltered version of me. And yeah. I have to be you know, aware of the responsibility that comes with that. But I also will not, I would rather not say anything than abandon myself saying something that's not my truth anymore. Yeah. Um, And again, I feel like that is a deep gift of where we are. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) That's a gift to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. All right. So you're ready? ready? Yes. So when a woman has trouble letting go of anger or rage, it's often because she's using rage to empower herself. While that may have been wisdom at the beginning, now she must be careful, for ongoing rage is a fire that burns her own primary energy. Mm. To be in this state is like speeding through life, pedal to the metal, trying to live a balanced life and the accelerator pressed all the way to the floor. Neither is the the fieriness of rage to be mistaken as a substitute for a passionate life. It is not life at its best. It It is a defense that, once the time of needing it for protection is past, costs plenty to keep. That was mm. the thing that got me. So when it's time, use it. Use it when you need it and then know when to release it, let it go. I so like after that. a time, yes. yeah, it burns intermittently hot, pollutes our ideas with its black smoke and, and, um, and other ways of seeing and apprehending. Okay. The angst and torment of times past rise up in the psyche in a cyclical basis. Although a deep purging discharges most of the archaic hurt and rage, the residue can never completely be swept clear. But it should leave a very light ash, not a hungry fire. So the clearing of residual rage must become a periodic hygienic ritual, one that releases us for to carry old rage beyond the point of its usefulness, is to carry a constant, if unconscious, anxiety. Sometimes people mm, sometimes people become confused and think that to be stuck in an outdated rage means to fuss and fume and to act out and toss and throw things. It does not mean that in most cases. It means to be tired all the time, to carry a thick layer of cynicism, to dash the hopeful, the tender, the promising. It means to be afraid you will lose before you open your mouth. It means to reach flashpoint inside whether you you show it on the outside or not. It means bilious, entrenched silences. It means feeling helpless, but there is a way out and it is through forgiveness. (laughs) I I read that one night before I went to bed when I was working on the theater stuff. And I feel like we just dropped the mic and that's it. Yeah. Like we, we're done. <laughs> no, let's unpack it. Let's well, unpack that's why it. I wanted to read it because, you know, oh yeah, sometimes you just can't find the words that other people. Okay, yeah. so so what, so there's two, well, so many things that I heard really clearly. The two things that feel the most important for me is the the line about the cost because mm. it's like, even when you feel like the rage is justifiable using my ridiculous mm. terminology before, because, you know, obviously if an emotion's turning up, it's for a reason. So let's bless our emotions, but it's at a cost to keep mm. carrying it through. And I think the other thing that really rang through to me is this clearing and releasing of rage. So not mm. pretending that it's a coping strategy to distract ourselves or shove it down or pretend it's not there or internalize it or any of the things that mm. I think as younger people we are conditioned to do. And mm. part of that is to do with the fact that our lives are very busy. We have less space, all of those things, unless we're very, very self-aware, we may not mm. 
give ourselves the time and the space and the pause to even feel what we're feeling. But um, to me, this is the power of telling stories, right? It's like, Mm. do we not both feel better after we've had a conversation Mm. about the fact that this is part of our experience and here's some of the reasons why we feel, you know, that there's a meaning to it or that there's a purpose or a blessing or a whatever. It Mm. doesn't even have to be a, a, you know, good in inverted commas reason for it. This is why like sharing the reality of where we are instead of trying to zhuzh it up is so freaking important. Mm. Um, Yeah. Because, yeah, if you're listening to this and you are also experiencing deep rage, it is part or can be, not for everybody, definitely Mm. not for everybody, but it is part of the experience. And I would say that for my anecdotal observation of myself, friends and clients, yeah. It is often the people that have the trauma and the unmet needs as kids. And I know, yeah. you know, if we were going to trauma, everyone's got trauma, but particularly the a parent that has deep wounds, it's not able to yeah. resource us in some way. Um, the reality is that we do have anger about that. And yeah. pretending it's not fucking there holds us in the pattern of not being able to be our true selves. Well, that's what it feels like to me. Like I'm like, if I'm not true to my anger Mm. and I'm not talking about it, I'm not expressing it, I'm not understanding the gift of it, I cannot Mm. get to forgiveness because I'm holding the anger. Yeah. So good. What what rings most true to you when you read that? And, you you know, you've obviously read it before as well, but what are the things that you really want to pull out of it? The, well, I think for me it was the, you know, using it, you, it's like yeah, um, consciously. Yeah, using it consciously and wisely, mm. um, and then knowing when to let it go. Knowing knowing when to let it go, but also mm. the, like you said, the 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 ritual part, mm. the, the clear the yeah. clearing of residual rage. So that rage that is left over once you've put it to use. Yeah. So you know periodically just checking in with yourself and you know and for me it's very yeah. much when I when people start to annoy me yep I'm like why am I even worried about why why is that mm-hmm. oh I'm still angry about something completely yeah. unrelated there's something fraying at me there's something yeah. yeah so um because you know, for the most part, people don't. I don't really care what people do. No, me um, neither. <laughs> that's another blessing of getting yeah. older, isn't it? It's like, yeah, whatever you do, you. <laughs> um. So yeah. So the deep purging and the and the and the clearing of residual way rage and that that word residual. It's like it's left over. It's not mm. needed. It's it's Doesn't like when, you, when, you, when you're making something and you cut the excess. Yeah. The, you know, the, or the pastry. You cut the pastry and you get rid of the excess or you know do you know what that's reminding me of I've just um I love like big shout out to Sarah Wilder from Wilder um talismans lover to bits and she has so much goodness to offer the world and she's just released an online version of her moon cycles um and one of the things that I've reconnected with now that I am choosing to take care of all of my needs is going back to the using the moon as a point where Mm. I can ritualize clearing things. Like I literally Mm. every month on the full moon, like, you know, set intentions on the new moon, but connecting to the cycle of like set your intentions and then what's fucking coming to the surface mid cycle where you're just like, ah, you know, that's an old pattern and I'm done with it. I release it. I'm ready to burn it to the Mm. ground. Mm. Um, Just having that constant, ability for self-reflection and self-responsibility and actually taking the like the self-leadership to be aware of the ways in which you are getting in your own way in terms mm-hmm. of repeated patterns and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it actually makes me think about me as a younger person. I felt like a lot of the time I was aggressive mm-hmm. and Now, like I'm assertive, absolutely, but it's a completely different energy to aggression. But what I'm what I'm feeling into is 
when I wasn't giving myself the the honoring of being real with how I felt and the anger and the rage that even as a younger person, like perimenopause was feeling, it came out as a trigger that was too far in the other direction. Yeah. Like I didn't have my needs met younger or I wasn't able to speak my truth or I wasn't whatever, feeling the whatever there. And so I had this like trigger of like, I will attack you before you attack me. Um, And over time, yeah, well, and because it's like a co- it's a protective mechanism, obviously, yeah. but it's also like a fuck you, I don't need you, I'm an independent woman, you don't need, you know, blah, 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 that whole story of I don't need anyone, um, which felt very true to me. And now I'm like, oh, my God, I'm a big marshmallow. I need my connection and my love and support and I love offering it to other people, but I definitely still have lots of like I'm by myself, I have to do it by myself, no one's here to, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think when I'm hearing that the passage that you just read, it makes me feel into my own softening from aggression to that much more quiet, mm. uh, much more clear, mm. this is the boundary and this is not the boundary and this is what I will tolerate. And, this, and I'm not for any stretch of the imagination saying that I'm perfect with this. But I feel like when you're holding on to a long ago emotion, it just means that you react in the now in a disproportionate way to what's actually in front of you. Yeah. And that's not good for anyone. No. No. And it's not, it's not, um, I was going to say it's not authentic. No, it's totally not. Yeah. Because it's still reacting to the lie. Like, it, yeah. it's, you know, if we come back to, what did I write down before? Denial of self. It's still reacting to the yeah, you know, the truth of all of us is that we are these magnificent, beautiful, worthy beings that are just mm. perfect the way they are. Um, the other thing is I feel like I always like to come back to this concept of balance in all things. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, day and night, hot and cold, like every single thing about our biology seeks its own balance. Yeah. So if you do too much of this, then something else comes yeah. in to balance it out, like all that sort of thing. Like an opposing force. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because otherwise everything would destroy itself. Like that that's actually the opposite of balance, destruction. Mm. Um, so I feel like if we're not expressing the rage now, mm. it has to come out sometime. Mm. Like it, there's an equal and opposite effect. So, yeah. Yeah. And Why um, not now? <laughs> You know, and a lot of people, uh, you see this a lot where, and a lot in women, mm. although, you know, I've experienced pe- <laughs> my fair share from men as well, is passive aggressiveness. Oh, know? yeah. Where, because because expressing anger is not um, acceptable, so yeah. it has to leak out somewhere. So, mm-hmm. I, it, you know, we project it and bleed it out over other people through passive aggressive behaviour. And, yeah. you know, my mum was... She had a master's degree in passive aggressiveness. Mm. And um, you know, even my dad, and it's just such a common defense mechanism that people yeah, use. It really is, isn't it? Um, but I can't tolerate it. Like I if it's if it's if it becomes evident in a close relationship or a friendship, I'll call it. Yeah. If we're not that close, you just won't hear from me again. Yeah. Because yeah, I yeah. just will not tolerate passive aggressive. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. It's it actually hurts hurts my soul yeah well it's, it's a trigger it's mean, some it's yeah. mean and it's unkind and mm. um I've had enough of it in my life and I've allowed yeah. it to um really penetrate my own self-worth yeah to try and work out what wow what, what, what are you trying to say uh, um you know and then I would scatter around trying to find where I'd done something wrong and I'm not even really quite sure because it was just so passive I don't know mm. and I just, well, I'm not, yeah, I ain't got time. I don't have time for it anymore. We talked about that in your first episode. You used um, the analogy of having, I hope it was you. I'm, I'm oh, the farm. The fence, yeah. Yeah, the fence and the farmyard, yeah. I yeah, explained. yeah. Yeah. It's like you don't even get inside the fence, so don't try. And yeah. it also reminds me, I'm not sure if I said it in that episode, but it reminds me of something Danielle Laporte wrote years ago, which is heart wide open, big motherfucking fence around it. Yeah. Like I will keep my heart open, but you yeah. may not be invited into yeah. the arena. <laughs> and that was introduced to me by um, 
And it was the, one of the most valuable pieces of advice. It was yeah. through a therapist that I was seeing. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it was, yeah. it's And passive aggressiveness is one of my um, no brains. It's like yeah. if you're passive aggressive, we cannot be friends. Mm. You can be sarcastic and a smart ass and whatever, but, yeah. um, you know, if there's something you need to say to me, you need to say it. Yeah. You know, I can't the do other- emotional manipulation. Mm-mm. This is, um, so this, I don't have that so much with passive aggressiveness itself, but I am unable to be in any sort of relationship with someone who's hot and cold, like Mm. turns up one day, best friend turns up the next day, couldn't give a shit because that's what I actually had way too much as a kid. And so it's like walking on eggshells to figure out how this person's going to interact with me. Am I going to be in the good books? Am I not going to be in the good books? Yeah. Um, very similar sort of feeling for me. It's just like zero yeah, chance you that you're getting inside the farmyard fence. Like you just yeah. not, don't even bother arriving. Like one hundred percent. And I, and because I had the same. You know, you'd wake up, you'd never know. I would never know whether my mum was in um, yeah, good you know, mood where she wanted to destroy me or whether or not she wanted to love me. And yeah. you would have to just to kind of you come out into the kitchen in the morning and just kind of suss out where mum mm. was and. You know, in my last relationship, it was, it was, it's funny how things just play out to really bring some of this stuff to the surface because, yeah, absolutely. you know, if I would get the silent treatment and I wouldn't know why. And I'd mm. be like this, you know, and I was back to being this 12 year old girl trying to work out what I could do to please my mum to get her affection. And I'm a grown woman in a relationship with someone mm. who's giving me the silent treatment. I'm like, yeah. ah, no. And it eats away at you. I completely relate to that. I used to play this game with myself. I'd come home from school and I'm like, this is so clear in my awareness physically. I can feel the school bag on my back and I can feel the yeah. uniform on my legs and the, my school shoes on. We had uh, probably like six or seven, maybe eight, I don't know, stairs, like old, um, like, those old brick like built-in stairs yeah, at the yeah. front yeah. and I used to play this game to be like good mood bad mood as I walked <laughs> up the stairs like this and it was like a little bit of a mantra of like stealing myself like I could be myself in the school well yeah. relatively as much as a teenage girl does yeah, yeah, but, yeah. you know I felt pretty comfortable and calm in the school environment like I knew the game like I was smart enough to you know because I, I kind of I got that game um not just thinking, not on a personal level, <laughs> my, my <laughs> emotional intelligence, not great. Anyway, um, but academically, totally fine. Um, but, yeah, I used to play this game of like, yeah, good mood, bad mood, good mood, bad mood, good mood, bad mood. And it's horrible to think how mm. much of my own okayness was dictated by that. Yeah. Um, do you know, um, I'm sure you do because you, you've studied this, um, my psychologist has just introduced me to the schemas, mm. like all the different schemas, and she's like yeah. after this, yeah, big yeah. dive into a pretty dark place that I've been in a, a few weeks ago now, um, this story of being completely unimportant, like unseen, unheard, not yeah. not loved, not like really, really like Fucking. I'm finally laughing because I that you don't matter. That you don't yeah, matter. You don't matter. Yeah. And I've never used the word unimportant yeah. ever, but that was what I was sitting in for days. And I was like, whew, okay, I'm really glad that I'm not in a position where I have to pretend that I've got my shit together in a corporate job at the moment because I totally do not have my shit together. Yeah. So I actually really allowed myself to unravel and just be in mm-hmm yeah horrible like a really but anyway where I was going was the scheme is one of them is emotionally deprived yeah and that the pattern of the schema and I I am I apologize to whoever created schema therapy if I'm getting this completely wrong but my understanding of the pattern is um very much about those protective stories of like I have to do everything by myself mm-hmm. because then no one gets to show you you're unimportant mm-hmm. because you're like fuck you I can do it by myself and yeah, yeah it just kind of yeah protective mechanism so if you're listening and you're aware of some of these I don't know patterns and they're creating pain in your present day mm-hmm. and you don't feel that you can unravel them yourself or you're or you're not 
courageous enough to because I certainly have spent a lot of my life thinking if I open this fucking box, I am not going to be able to deal with the emotion. Yeah. Um, please go and seek out like a professional that can help yeah. you actually yeah. sit and, you know, someone who can give you a frame of reference and some understanding about where these patterns come from because you're yeah. not an angry person. You're not mm. a rageful person. It comes from somewhere. It rises trying to talk to you. Mm about something that is yeah denial of self I want to say yeah like, you know. and it's it's really I think one of the things for me and and because you know with the the psychology stuff but also I work in um the research center that I work yes. in um center for human factors mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. and socio-technical systems it's really about how you know the human and the systems that we live in interact and mm. um it, it's it, one of the main tenets of human factors research is that it's the emerging, like um, I'm trying to say it without sounding too technical, but so basically no one is to blame. The system, the system, different components of the system interact mm-hmm. and um, issues or mistakes or um, errors or adverse events emerge from that Mm -hmm. so this whole idea that you know whenever you see a news something in the news about um an adverse event happening we always go Mm -hmm. it's someone's fault it was human error well it's not it's Mm -hmm. it's not so this whole idea and it relates to how I kind of processed it the whole idea that we are we function within the system Mm -hmm. that we have yeah, whether that be we want to call it the patriarchy, whether you yeah. want to, you know, whatever, however, whatever. Yeah. we are, yeah. So our rage and our anger is an emergent property of the system, of the interactions within the different, or the 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 interactions between the different components. Components. Of the system. Yeah. So it just for me, it's that whole. It took a whole. Just that weight of responsibility of every I fuck everything up or it's I shouldn't be angry or you know like you your anger's not warranted or you know it's just it's like oh okay this is just part of this is an emergent property of the system mm. <laughs> I know that sounds very sciencey but it is it's it's We're not. We're not to blame. We're we are we are a product of our upbringing. We're a product of our yeah the environment we live around in. us. We're a product yeah. of our environment. You know. Um, yeah, I just think that we need to give ourselves a break. Mm. I think as I'm hearing you speak, um, I'm going to look more into the human factors end of things because I really like that perspective. Mm. I also am feeling very much so that, I don't know, years and years and years ago I had a yoga teacher that once said to me, the very definition of stress is the difference between what you expect and what reality is. Mm -hmm. And so when I am ever in, not ever, but, you know, when I'm conscious of the fact that I'm creating a story about being stressed Mm -hmm. or overwhelmed or whatever, I do like to ask myself, What am I expecting to happen and Mm. what is reality? And Mm. shifting or my invitation to myself is is always more around accepting what is. Mm. And I think sometimes we can get so into trying to figure out the reasons why Mm. and wanting our state, particularly our emotional state, to be different to what it is Mm. when actually a much more gentle and self-compassionate way of dealing with things is to just surrender to what is Mm. and to know that there is purpose behind it and that the universe by definition likes a balance. Mm. And if we then add in what you were saying about that there is actually no one thing to blame and certainly not ourselves, Mm then isn't there a soft place to land where we can just mm. be like, I'm feeling how I'm feeling. Yeah. It's my responsibility to respond to how I'm feeling, absolutely, because yeah. we're always mm. self-responsible. Um, but to not try and 
push through it or pretend it's different to what it is because that is going to cause more stress on our system than anything else. Yeah. Um, and to just be curious about it, you know, because yes. like you were saying about the expectations and that's, you know, one of the things with the human factors is we talk a lot about mental models and, mm-hmm. you know, um, when I realised just how much of our own personal experience is based on our own mental models. Oh, yeah. You know, and challenging all worldviews or however you want to frame mm-hmm. it, schemas, Yep. what models. we expect to be what we is what expect we find. to happen or how it should be or yep. what what our previous experience of life is mm-hmm. you know because um we 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 function in the world based on our experiences yep. you know, absolutely you know and to be able to challenge those mental models mm. you know and I'll, I'll the example classic example is there's a lot of women our age that get to the point where we're so fed up with patriarchy and You know, I'm still on the fence about whether I'm a feminist. A lot of people will tell me that I am or Mm -hmm. if if you said to them, is Nicole a feminist, they go, fuck yeah, she's such a feminist. But I'm not so sure Mm. Um, because I've had to really challenge some of my mental models that I, I, well, first of all, I grew up um, with the impression that women were bad and yes. that you couldn't trust women. Yes. So, you know, and then I got to perimenopause and had some really shitty experiences and started to realise just how much we were just at the mercy of the patriarchy. Mm-hmm. And then I was swung the other way and I'm like, fucking hate men. Like, <laughs> you know, all of them are the same, the assholes. <laughs> and so, and I'm like, well, that mental model is not serving me. It's not serving no. my sons that I'm no. trying to raise. It's not exactly. serving my daughter who, you know, is, just absorbing my mental models <laughs> yeah so yeah. you know having the courage to challenge some of those mental models and it's yeah. not that you're wrong mm. it's just do they really serve you like yeah. do they really work for you no. um and okay they may keep you safe for a while because you know that mental model of um men can't be trusted really i wasn't ready to start dating i'm probably still not mm-hmm. um and so those mental models have kept me safe, I guess, because they, yeah. they fuck off across. Yeah, the- <laughs> fuck off. If you've got <laughs> testicles, fuck off. <laughs> you know, at the but you know that it's that's about it comes back to that you know clearing off the res- residual rage. You know that mental model doesn't serve me anymore, so it's time to challenge it mm. and come up with something that's a little bit softer and a little bit more realistic, and mm. that is going to allow what I need for love and connection. Yeah, exactly. Um, Exactly. So. Yeah, it's all just a story. And that's why I love about like when you're talking to someone about relationships and I'm just like, we all need to remember that we're all having the same experience and making completely different meanings of it. Yeah. Because what we are filtering for, excuse me, and what we expect to be true like mm. all of those versions of reality are literally the letting things in or not yeah. of our reality. And it's like we have a responsibility to look at how we are limiting or opening doors for ourselves. Like yeah. what is it that you want? Why have you not gotten it? Most yeah. of the time because your story of the world doesn't yeah. allow you to access it. Yeah. And they're good questions to ask a potential partner too because it's one yeah. thing, one of my no-brainers, it's a it's a deal breaker is mm-hmm. and it's not because it so you have to have done the work. Like you have to have done yeah. challenged your own mental models, challenge, you know, the self-awareness stuff. And it's not about going, ah, oh, I'm a bit woke, I'm more woke than you. You know, oh, it's not God. about that. It's not oh. about being um more aware or anything like that it comes down for me it comes down to people who are not self-aware are dangerous to me Mm. because they can emotionally hurt me so if you're not aware of how your size 10 boots end up accidentally kicking other people in the face as you do you know what I mean like people don't quite often People that I've been in relationship with, mm. I don't necessarily go, oh, they're an asshole mm. because they might just be subconsciously going through the world, like yeah. not having any self-awareness of how their behaviour impacts others. So mm-hmm. to me, that's dangerous. If you're not aware of how your behaviour impacts others, mm. 
then you're dangerous for me emotionally. Yeah. Um, and so there, that's where that responsibility comes in to own our shit and to, to own our stuff and to understand where our rage comes from. I feel like we need to have like an offshoot of this podcast, which is when you're ready to start dating, I want an update of all of the first dates where you say, are you, are you aware of your mental models? Yeah. So, well, <laughs> no, and I don't, I'm, you know, I'm being lighthearted about it and totally honoring the fact that I love hearing when women, because to me, that's a boundary again, right? Yeah. You get in the fence if you've got self-awareness and self-responsibility and you do not get anywhere near the property if you don't. And that's the boundary I set for myself because A, I, I understand that I'm worth that, but also B, I am no longer available for putting myself in harm's way. Mm. Yeah. 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 <sighs> and by doing that, you negate the chance of unnecessary future rage. <laughs> yeah. Because if the boundary is firm and it's not being crossed, then you have no reason to be angry. Yeah. So, so, so while, so while anger and rage is an awareness of a boundary being crossed, it's also an awareness of where we've allowed the boundary to be crossed. Oh shit, yeah. You know, so yeah. it's not all about just the other person came in with their size ten boots and crossed a boundary, and now we're angry. It's mm-hmm. like you were saying before that anger comes becomes internalized as well because we've allowed it. So. Mm. Yeah, so doing all of those things negates the need for rage and we live a happier life. Yeah. Like a more content, fulfilled, peaceful life. Yeah, and less less swings away from our true self. Yeah. And, again, I feel like that is the gift of this pushing through the eye of the needle thing. Yeah. I imagine, and when I talk to my friends who are on the other side of menopause, one of the deepest um, repeated things is I feel like I know myself yeah, and therefore I value myself way more than I ever have. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to me that's like that's wild and fucking free. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's no freedom in getting stuck in, yeah, recreating mm-hmm. the same patterns and not being self-responsible and all of those things. No. Oh. It's been such a good conversation. <laughs> How did we go? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I As soon as you said anger, because we had kind of earmarked this other concept of like ageing and how women are, you know, become invisible, blah, blah, blah. Um, right. And then when you said anger, I was like, oh, my God, this is so in line with so many things that are in my field at the moment. And I do yeah. feel like it's, like I said, it's like, like this, can we not um, downplay this rage mm. to just try and minimize it to mood swings because mood swings feels a little bit less um powerful yeah. <laughs> yeah. and can we not just prescribe antidepressants to deal with it oh please no <laughs> and not taking away from yeah so it has oh, to come with the caveat 100%. Yes. Yes. yes antidepressants have a place absolutely uh, all psychiatric medication has a place but yeah. i but my experience with my GP, and I love mm. my GP, but when I went in and explained to her how I was feeling, mm. really tired, foggy mm. brain, mm. Was angry all the time, blah, 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 her go-to was antidepressants. And I said, yep. no, I actually think I need to sit with all of this and, and what it is. I just, like at the time, I wanted some hormone therapy. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Me, she said, no, you're not quite 50 yet, so we're not. But, yeah, so her go-to was the um, yeah. antidepressant. And I said, but I'm not depressed. She said, yes, but it will address some of those symptoms. And I'm like, oh, mm. but you just, you're just pushing it away again, you know. But also you're not, this is a parallel conversation to the one that I've had before with Jodie Priest, who was an early um, guest on this show, and she shared in her interview about having a similar conversation. Um, hers was at the right at the end of breast cancer treatment where Mm. um, and she actually chose she listened to her body and chose not to have her final round or final two oh I listened to that episode yeah Yeah. and she actually said to her doctor and it's almost word for word what you just said no I feel like I need to experience this yeah fully 
And there yeah. was like a very strong and wise knowing and anchor in her, similar to what you're saying, that mm. as much as this is painful, it's mm. necessary and there is an equal and opposite amount of mm. benefit, blessing, growth, whatever you, like whatever you want to call it on the yeah. other side of it. And also very much saying that I am very aware that statistically suicide rates for 45 to 55-year-old women are the highest growing group of suicide statistics. Mm. And I would hazard a guess, and obviously this is not with a science or evidence-based hat on, but I would hazard a guess that some of that is to do with Mm. Yeah, the experience of perimenopause and depending on, you know, like if we were going through this rage, like I said before, with teenage girls or dying parents or like, a, you know, major life stress mm. on top of it, um, mm. I would say that I would be dealing with things a lot less yeah. ably. So yeah. whilst yeah. for us the right decision right now at this point in time yeah. is to sit in the fire. Yeah. Um, and that's not, not to say right that decision. I wouldn't accept Mm. any presents or any other kind of medication yeah at another time yeah um, because i have friends that um yeah take small doses and they said that it's made a huge, huge difference, difference. Yeah. yeah um but yeah for right now i really felt uh, you know and i took this year off study specifically to to i don't even know what the word is integrate to yeah, um, make some more space yeah rest yeah. when I need to all that stuff yeah so, mm. we could keep talking forever we better not yeah. I am so bad at some of my interviews lately have been like an hour and a half I'm like oh my goodness okay we will behave ourselves we may well have <laughs> Nick back for a third episode <laughs> thank you so much for your thank wisdom thank you so much for having me yeah I love these conversations I just yeah I keep saying I keep putting it out there Someone teach me how to just earn an income from just interviewing 24-7. No, not 24-7, but, you know, (laughs) as my mate, because I just, yeah, I just think sharing our experiences and sharing our stories is so deeply healing for us, but also for the people that are in a a similar journey or around someone that's in a similar journey. Yeah. Um, And I absolutely feel like we should have a shout out to, the men who are walking alongside women in the middle of this, like my husband, who I yeah. turned around to him the other day and said, only four or five more years. And he's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like deer in the headlights. And I was like, I am so grateful. I'm so yeah. grateful that you are this calm in the storm of this perimenopausal sea. Um, and I just read a book. I can't remember. It might've been second spring or wise power. I'm not sure which one, but it basically says, Dear men, she will come back to you even mm. better and more powerful and more beautiful than ever before. And I'm like, please just wait for me. <laughs> so, yeah, honouring that too. Love it. Yeah. Thank you, my beautiful friend, for Thank being you. on again. My pleasure. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode and I trust you're walking away with inspiration, aha, maybe some chiropractic adjustments of the soul where you've realized perhaps some ways that you're getting in your own way or something that needs to be healed or something that's calling to you that your heart really, really wants to birth or create or step into in this second cycle of life. And if that's you, I am throwing my arms wide open and inviting you to check out all of the ways that we could potentially partner together at kyliepatchett.com.au. That's my website for the podcast and also one-on-one and group programs in midlife mentorship, yoga and breath work in specifically designed uh, menopause classes online. And also super excitingly, a list of retreats around Australia that I have been blessed to partner with some pretty darn spectacular humans (laughs) who also help midlife mavens through this transition point so if you are looking for some support some community some tools um, just a safe place to actually reconnect to who you are what you want and come home to your own power and magnificence i would love to welcome you into any one of those containers so head on over to kyliepatchett.com.au and i will be back in your ears very very soon